thank you for coming. Um, this is the, like um, Kathy said, the, um, the future is short. And um, I wanted to just first start this panel by going down the line and reading a little bit about each of these filmmakers and then show um, a clip or a trailer from their films just so you have some understanding of the work that they've done. So I'm actually gonna start with Sarah. Uh, Sarah Newins, <laughs> wave your hand. <laughs> Sarah. Sarah Newins is a documentary filmmaker and Emmy winning Emmy Award winning editor. Her first feature, Top Spin, was acquired by First Run Features and received rave reviews from the LA Times and the Wall Street Journal during its festival run and limited theatrical release. Her recent short documentary, Footprint, won top prizes during its festival run and is featured as part of the New York Times Op Doc series. Her films have screened at numerous festivals, including Doc NYC, Sarasota, Traverse City, Rooftop Films, Mill Valley, Big, Va Big Sky, among others. She's a graduate of the MFA Documentary Film Program at Stanford University and is currently based in Los Angeles and continues to create nonfiction content through her production company, Wild Pear Films. Um, and then next is Kim Snyder. Raise your hand. <laughs> it's Kim Snyder, it's previous film was the Peabody award-winning documentary Newtown, which premiered at the 2016 Sundance Film Festival and was named in Newsweek and Huffington Post among the top films of 2016. Newtown screened at uh, premier festivals worldwide and was theatrically, theatrically released, followed by a national broadcast on PBS's Independent Lens and her most widely watched documentary of the past, and as the most widely watched documentary of the past decade. Her most recent film, Lessons from a School Shooting, Notes from Dunblane, premiered at the 2018 Tribeca Film Festival and was, was awarded Best Documentary Short. <laughs> so powerful. Okay. And then the, uh, Joanna Natsusaraga, did I say that right? Close, sorry. Um, is a British film producer best known for the Academy Award winning Netflix original short documentary, The White Helmets. Joanna also produced BAFTA and Oscar nominated doc documentary, Varunga, which won over 50 international awards, including an Emmy, a Peabody, a Television Academy Honor, a Grierson, and a DuPont Columbia Award for Outstanding Journalism. Joanna has led some of the world's most impactful global film campaigns, including Doc Impact Award winners, Varunga and No Fire Zone films which focus on some of the most difficult social change issues of our time. Her work, is in, her work is global in scope, collaborating with organizations and international leaders across the political spectrum, as well as business, arts, and phil philanthropic, philanthropic works. Joanna founded award-winning UK production company, Violet Films. <laughs> and last but not least is Fariha Zaman. Is that correct? Zaman. Zaman, excuse me. Um, so. Fariha is a Brooklyn-based filmmaker, critic, and curator. Her industry experience includes Magnolia Pictures, IFP, The Flaherty Seminar, and Field of Vision, where she recent, recently served as the production manager. She is credited as production manager on Crime and Punishment and Concussion Protocol. Zaman teaches documentary and residence at Bard College. Okay, so um, uh, we're gonna start this panel. Um, I'm gonna go down the line and ask each of these women to just talk about the genesis of their film and talk a little bit about it. And I'm gonna start with you, Faria, just because we just saw this. Uh, this is this beautiful film about this, the f what's the name of the frog? It's called The Scrotal Frog. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you can tell us a little <laughs> bit about the film for those of not, not getting the full picture of what it is and then kind of the genesis of how it became. Sure, um, and my uh, bio didn't include the films I've made, I, so I had actually made uh, a couple of features before I did any short work. So I've made three features and now four shorts, I guess. Um, but one of the things that I love working about short form, especially when it is a commissioned film, which this was, um, is you get to take some risks. So there were a lot of things in this film that I uh, had not um, experimented with before. I'd never done like a voiceover narrative. And then this, just the subject matter itself, I'd never done a nature doc um, or anything in that arena in an, an envi environmental film. I'd mostly made um, you know, these feature docs that were sort of a like deep dive portrait of a place and like a, a particular American regional community um, in a moment of crisis. And this film um, I had the pleasure to make because um, uh, an organization called the Redford Center, which funds um, uh, environmental films, it's sort of a Sundance Institute um, offshoot, um, put a call out to people who had received Sundance grants before asking for films that de you know, dealt with environmental subject matter, but hopefully in a way that was, a that was still cinematic and creative and, and not necessarily sort of um, more straightforward activist work. Um, and uh, I thought, 
about this idea that I'd had and never, ever thought I'd make a film about. Again, I, I didn't think I'd go in this uh, arena, but I, from a young age, um, was really, I, I always loved animals. I was, you know, I had like my walls plastered with pictures of the animals, the weirder, the better. And kids would come over and say, you know, why, why would you put that on your wall? It's so ugly. And this idea like stuck with me from a young age that I was baffled at the idea that you would call a bird or a lizard ugly? Like, what does that even mean? Why do, why do, do um, our beauty standards have any bearing on um, creatures that we, you know, uh, don't need to assess uh, <laughs> for, like, a potential mate partnership or something like that? Um, and so the idea, and I, I am working on a, um, a series version of this, actually, um, was, you know, why do only animals that have uh, that are that are considered attractive to human beings have conservation efforts around them, while the rest are either less left to fend for themselves or kind of have these active um, narratives around um, how how bad they are, like these you know folk tales about like the hyena and and anything we don't anything we don't um, think is cute. So the film is called Nobody Loves Me, which um, the series will too, and we. Um, knew we wanted to focus on a specific animal for it um, so that we could tell that story a little bit in depth and engage with the community that the frog is part of. Um, and I, I have to say that scrotal frog is its Latin name. It's not just a colloquialism uh, because of the skin. It was a very fun experience um, talking to these conservationists who would, you know, qu like sort of seriously explain, you know, there are more, the skin has more folds because it's, Li lives in uh, oxygen deprived waters and um, how do you find, um, how do you help people um, <sighs> see, like uh, cross that barrier uh, from an initial reaction to the way that it looks into understanding um, that this has the same sort of needs and desires as all the world's creatures. Okay, great. Um, so Kim, can you talk a little bit about the genesis of um, return or uh, Lessons from Dunblane. Sure. Well, um, I had in, uh, found myself through some happenstances, tragically uh, up in up in Newtown after that massacre that I think we all remember in, in 2012. And um, one of the first people I met was Father Bob, who had buried eight children in one week. And it was only weeks later. And um, he was so clearly, I don't think I'd ever confronted anybody that um, soon into PTSD in a, in a very uh, visceral, visible way. I mean, he just couldn't get through a, a sentence without breaking down. And, um, and I was taken with this. I'm not um, uh, just to see a priest that vulnerable and that broken up was something you don't see that often. And so I asked him where he was getting support because it occurred to me he is a priest and he's he, he doesn't have a wife and a family, and you know he has his congregation. And he said, actually, I've been getting support from this stranger in Dunblane, Scotland. And then I went and f uh, I remembered a little bit about Dunblane, but not really, and uh, looked it up and also became um, just uh, taken with how similar those two crimes were. They were the same time of the morning, the same length of time, sort of when it all happened. and. It was just these odd parallels. They're both these bucolic little hamlets of places. So it sort of had it stuck in my mind that there would be something that would um, mash up the two in some way. And then there was this connection between these two priests. And I thought it was important to look at this sort of lesson that um, Britain and also Australia, after their one big mass shooting, had immediately done something and like of course and changed lots of policy and laws and that we continued not to. So right away it, it uh, notwithstanding not knowing at that time that I was going to make a feature length film that delved into the whole community, I always thought this is its own separate um, pearl of, a, of a, a poignant story of a bonding between these two men of faith who walked in these shoes that no one could understand and and the vulnerability of them as uh, as men of faith. Great, thank you. And then um, Sarah, if you want to talk a little bit about footprint and the genesis of that. Sure. Um, so prior to making footprint, um, I primarily made as a director films that were character driven and interview driven, and 
Um, and I also make my living as an editor, and that's m the majority of the work I do. And so I was really craving a different kind of storytelling. And in the back of my mind, I had always just had this, this notion that I would make a purely observational film without a central character um, that could hopefully explore a space rather than a person. And, um, and then, you know, a couple years ago, I was um, visiting the World Trade Center Memorial for the first time since the fountains were completed. And I just had very different expectations of what that space would look and feel like. Um, and when I got there, it was rather jarring to just all of the commotion and all the different kinds of um, experiences that people were having and the way they were engaging with the space. Um, and so I just had to kind of settle in and just observe until I saw these like really beautiful poetic moments. In particular, a father explaining to his young child what had happened and it just sort of blew my mind that like, oh, there are people who were not alive during this at all and that we have to communicate to them what that experience and how that impacted the world. And so um, it just felt like a mini city symphony and I just wanted to go back with the crew and um, it just felt really manageable to, to you know shoot over a short period of time and then try to, because I'm an editor, I have the luxury of being able to kind of edit on my own time and so, um, and so I did. Great. Um, and then Joanne, if you want to talk about how White Helmets um, came to be. Yeah, sure. We, we, we had just finished, well, sort of finished uh, Virunga and its tour, and we were looking for the next project, and both Orlando and I, the director of Virunga, um, had been following the White Helmets and their work for some time, um, and, you know, we, we generally make political films. Syria was an issue that was really kind of at the forefront of our minds, understanding how to enter that region space you know idea was 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 very difficult um, and we'd like to tell hopeful stories um, and so the white helmets who are for those who don't know rescue workers who are Syrian themselves and, and dig um, for the living or the dead under the rubble um, had a lot of resonance with the rangers of Warunga that we'd worked with um, and so we reached out to them and and just asked if they would be willing to collaborate and luckily they were Wow. Um, so all of your films are just tremendous and powerful and, and also short, which is the topic of this panel, which is the future is short. So now we'll go back to Joanna. And if you could talk a little bit about the choice um, or decision to make your film into a short as opposed to a feature film. Um, you know, when we went to see the White Helmets in Turkey, they, you know, they just said, yes, we would like you to make a film about us. And you know, that's partly because we are being attacked physically, mentally. You know, they were being bombed. They had cyber attacks. There's this horrible thing in Syria where, uh, which is called a double tap, where they will go to uh, a rescue site and then the regime or its allies will know that they are going to rescue people that are living or dead. So the planes will circle back and bomb the same site again knowing that they will hit the rescue workers. So they were being atta attacked in every possible way you could imagine. And the cities that they were in, because of course they, they are generally in the cities where the regime is not, were, you know, were falling one by one. So when we first met them, it was just before the fall of Aleppo. Um, and we just didn't have time to make a feature. There wasn't time to kind of wait for that city to fall and you know, tweedle about for three years and, and go, ta-da, here's a film about all the awful things that happened. I mean, the reality is you, you're still making a film about all the awful things that happened, but in, in a more concurrent way to the news, in a way that you know, potentially even has the smallest of positive effects for these people, uh, in that at least their story is being told. So that was very clear to us. Um, and actually, um, there, was no, there was no question. Orlando, the director, was, was also very kind of set on being short. Um, and Sarah, when you decided to do, it, it, Footprint is an op, at a New York Times op doc. Um, so how did that happen? And um, would you wanted to make this, how long is your film? Uh, it's 18, 18 minutes. 18 minutes, okay. So how did you, um, how did that come to be? Did you pitch them? Did they come to you or? Um, yeah, I mean, I set out to make a short primarily for practical reasons. One is that funding can be the greatest barrier for many filmmakers. <laughs> Um, and so this was something that I knew that I could do in a short amount of time and fund myself. 
Um, and then um, I also had been very inspired by all of the New York Times op docs that were on that platform. I mean, it's an incredible platform, and shorts are getting more attention now than I think they ever have. And it's just a very exciting time, I think, for um, documentary filmmakers. And um, and so I really set out to have that as the goal for the film and establish a relationship with them early on. Before I shot, I said, this is what I'm thinking about doing, and just kept that dialogue going until I had a rough cut that I could send them. And they came on board and were supportive like right away, which was really nice. That's great. Um, and then, Kim, you touched on that you found this um, story in the mid. So this was the first story you were working on before Newtown? Is that? Uh, well, he was the first character, and then um, it, it had remained in my, my head that um, this was separate, mm -hmm. and this just, I guess, to me, it's like short stories versus novels. You just sort of know when something um, n is the perfect arc for a short. It wasn't really, a, there wasn't much, uh, there was never any questioning that that would be a short, a perfect short for me. Would you go back and revisit those two and follow <coughs> that relationship? Because it must still be going on, right? The two of them. In, in, in terms of a film? Yeah, or another. Next no, no, no. I really feel um, there was a sort of n narrative um, element in the exchange of letters that, um, that felt right for a short. And um, yeah, it just feels. Yeah. No, it's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and then for you, yours was initially supposed to be a short, right? Because it was commissioned. So, um, how did you come up? And I want to ask all of you this, but um, the length. I think it's so fascinating because they're all different lengths, and there's different storytelling um, that comes through in the different lengths. Did you know the length going in? Um, did it did it evolve? Did it change as you were editing? Um, we were lucky for this particular commission not to have a set time. Um, sometimes when you do commission work, you will, uh, you know, they'll say on our platform we only make films that are three to five minutes or we only show films that are 10 to 12 minutes or what have you. Um, when not given that constraint, which I don't necessarily mind, it's, I, I think when you've made a couple of films, it's okay to go in saying, I, I know what the shape of something that needs to be five minutes will look like, but my preference is when you find something that you're excited to make a film about and it, it sort of naturally emerges what the length is meant to be. I think, like you said, Kim, you can sort of feel what, how, how you best tell that story and sometimes that, that it, it shouldn't be limitless. It shouldn't be about every single thing that was a part of it and getting to zero in on something um, is really exciting. I think um, for this film, it's a, it, it was a little longer than we expected, I think, because, you know, of course, part of the joy of making documentaries is um, not knowing what's going to happen. <laughs> and the, the, you just get a taste of it in the clip, but there was a, the, the sort of human relationship element and how this animal fits into the larger um, environment, we didn't know that was going to be a part of the film. Um, but for example, I'm, so I made two shorts last year. One was Nobody Loves Me and one was is called American Carnage, which um, was actually a, a field of vision short. Um, and it's about how Steve Bannon is a, it's about him being a failed documentary filmmaker. And it's an, um, primarily archival. We, we used um, uh, clips from the nine documentaries that he's made. And that uh, film ended up, I think it's nine minutes, and it ended up being much shorter than we expected because you sit there and realize that the effect of watching his very um, ho sort of hostile work was too much. Um, it made its point quicker than we expected, and so we let it be that instead of trying to, you know, force the material into another length. Do you edit? Do you have an editor? Do you edit yourself? Or um, I w work with an editor. <laughs> I like to be really hands-on. I'm, I'm, I'm very collaborative in the editing process. I think like the discussion generated during that time is so good and healthy for your film. Um, but I. I, I wouldn't, I, I am not a professional level editor. Um, I'm s I just am very, very appreciative to have s somebody, first of all, somebody else's perspective, but then um, somebody who, who can, who understands that language of like, you know, I feel that this thing isn't working and, and they're bringing fresh ideas to the table. And also just that first minute when you're like, okay, here's, <laughs> here's all this stuff. Like, please make sense of this in a way that didn't already spring from my mind. So I've, I've, I worked with editors on, on both films. And Kim, how did you um, come up with the length? How long is your film again? 
23. 23, okay. How did you come up with that length? And did you work with an editor or do you edit yourself? No, I worked with an editor. I worked with a great editor, Penny Falk. I worked with on this one. And, um, you know, we just sort of felt through. We didn't have a prescribed. I think one of the liberating great things, Netflix came in much later, is how in the last couple of years things have become more length agnostic. Mm -hmm. And I think that's um, very liberating. And um, like you said, some things just feel like they should be nine minutes. And there isn't this kind of broadcast half hour thing anymore that you have to slip into necessarily. Um, so that it felt, you know, there was a, like like all editing processes, we had one other beat with another letter and was like, no, nah, that, that feels like maybe it's one too many. And so. And Sarah, you, um, you edit your own work. So how did you come up with 18 minutes? <laughs> um, well, I, um, it was an experiment really um, <laughs> in the edit room. I mean, I was limited in the sense that there was only um, two days, we only shot for two days in, on the grounds, which in limited chunks, so it's almost added up to one full day. And going into the edit, I knew, okay, I wanted to um, showcase the arc of, a, of one day on the, um, at the site. Um, but aside from that, it was really just a lot of like finding the right order of these collection of moments that felt like, you know, the right emotional journey that I had intended the audience to kind of go on. And, um, and so it was a lot of just um, playing Tetris with those moments and lining it up and watching it and, you know, and sharing it with trusted friends to, and watching it with trusted people to kind of get that feedback to know, you know, um, the right length. And then, you know, fortunately, New York Times is also like pretty length agnostic. I mean, they're really open to all, I mean, it has to be short, obviously, but like, all different kinds of lengths um, they're open to, which is great. So I didn't feel any pressure from them to like make it 18 minutes. Um, I shared my first cut with them. I shared I think was like 27 minutes, and then so through two rounds of notes, we got it down to 18. Oh, okay. They, they gave you notes. Okay. And then Joanna, t yours is 38, 39 minutes. Yeah, I think 39. Yeah. So how did you guys come up with that? And was there, um, if you could talk a little bit about the challenges of that length too? Um, I mean. You know, we still, despite not wanting to wait for it to be a feature, we still wanted it to be a meaty piece of work. Um, so, you know, that felt like a good length. Um, and in, in some ways, we found that more challenging, both because of the speed of the edit, but also just, you know, in terms of storytelling, more challenging than making a short short. Because Orlando and I have done that before as well. And because you don't have the space and the time for the kind of breath in between you still have to make something of such substance that it has a big, you know, a big kind of meaty narrative arc. Um, and yet you're not making a feature, so you just don't have that grace. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging length, certainly, yeah. Yeah, and you were talking earlier, we were talking upstairs about um, the distribution and, um, and funding, and you, this film won, an o she won the Oscar for Best Short Documentary, which is congratulations, by the way. Um, and when you're making a short, when you, start making a short documentary, is that something that is now easier or is it more difficult? Is it, um, is there more, it seems like with Netflix and all the other platforms that there's an easier way to get it out there and there it's more of, an op there's the world is more open to short docs now. Yeah, I mean, I would say we're, you know, we're hugely blessed and we're hugely blessed with relationships and certainly, you know, certain doors open more quickly now. Um, but I don't think that documentary making gets any easier ever. So I think anybody thinking that that happens is, is mistaken because each and every film is its own, you know, set of challenges, and sometimes funding comes slightly more easily, and sometimes it doesn't, because it's just everything's in context and everything's in the in the context of the exact film that you're making and the moment that you're making it in. Um, so no, I don't I don't think it gets easier. Great, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, and Sarah, how about you? Yeah, I mean the idea that is it there's I mean obviously with the times there's they have this platform where that's what they're doing but in your right. other you know you've other done other short docs and um, of your own work like is it easier to get them made to get them seen is shorts the new frontier or <laughs> the new you know I mean I'm certainly more excited about shorts right now I I mean I I only made one feature and it was um, it was a, a slog to get funding for it and um, especially because a lot of times I mean this is a very different more meditative piece than 
but a lot of times I'm attracted to um, subject matters like um, like sports subject matters. Or my, my feature was about um, the top table tennis players in the U.S. Um, and to get funding for that, I mean, it, you know, without having an overt social issue attached to films too, that makes it a lot harder. And so it feels like it still feels like a great barrier to making. I don't know if I'll make another feature, <laughs> to be quite honest. And I really enjoy the short form. There's something about you know, not spending years and years and years on a project, too. That's very satisfying. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, it fits into your busy life <laughs> sometimes yeah, exactly. a little better. And what about you? What, can you just talk, I, I know you might have said this earlier, but the, the um, you made Sandy Hook and then you made, um, yeah, so that was, and did you always know that you were going to do that or make the short version? Um, and when you were making it, did you ever, like, rethink how you were going to do it? Was it going to be thinking that maybe it would be longer? Or was it always just, you? it was always a short? Uh, it was always sort of over here, like there's this, like it was a very strong instinct, but then there wasn't the time. Um, so it was something that was like lots of projects. It's like little drawers in your dresser that's over here, but it's closed right now. And then when I could, I revisited it. Revisited, but I was going to say, um, I do feel excited that there are a lot more places to go when you're in a circum, especially with social issue kinds of, I, I, I think it is different, but when you're, there's something that uh, feels like uh, very urgent, there are more places, whether it be field of vision, like that you can sort of reach out to now. Um, th there's a project like that that I had to put on hold um, a bit ago, but it, it had to do with another uh, feature film that I'd made and a, and a crazy thing that happened eight years later from that. And I did feel like it was like calling a few people and saying, I've got to get down there like in four days and can I get an emergency grant? Um, that there are more places to reach out to do that kind of thing. Um, and um, so, uh, so I am heartened that, that it feels like there's more opportunities to, and, and more um, unlikely, uh, I think there are more places like in this particular project I'm talking about, I think it was like I reached, I ended up talking to the Southern Poverty Law Center, and I think there's more places like that that are starting to understand the power of short media and that maybe it's worth putting money behind. And, you know, it's not just the five likely um, suspects of New York Times Opdocs or Netflix or, you know, so that's, you know, new places are exciting in terms of reaching out. Yeah, and how about your um, experience? Is there is it a relief to make a short as opposed to you've made? I didn't realize you made three <laughs> features, but um, think is it a relief? Is it easier on your life? I I would agree that I never use the word easier. I mean, honestly, that that Bannon film, um, American Carnage, is the hardest film I've ever made, just because of the creative questions involved. With like, if you make an archival film in which the quality of <laughs> the archival is bad. How is your film not bad? Um, was an ongoing issue, as was being just sort of assaulted by uh, Steve Bannon's artwork. Um, but um, uh, there is a way in which you can wrap your head around the period of time it might take um, and the scope of the project. And I know um, being sort of on the other side and, and working for Field of Vision, you know, part of why they were founded was this was to provide more opportunities for filmmakers because there are times when a feature yes is has a conscribed um, time period but there are also times when a feature um, unfolds over years and it's like how do we offer something to filmmakers where they can continue to make work work that they care about and are interested in but it's really feasible in between other projects or while other projects are ongoing the budget f and and paying a fair amount all at once um, so that everybody's being paid, perhaps not commercial rates, but fairly. Um, how do we make how do how do we make that possible? So I think that those things are a relief. The idea of like, okay, that what what my needs are and what this is going to look like, um, the the time and money <laughs> involved in those things um, is m is easier to wrap your head around and 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 get support for. Um, so, Joanne, I wanted to talk about just storytelling and cra the craft of storytelling and in White Helmets, and it was in the trailer, which was so beautiful, that moment where they find the baby. And that seemed to be, when I watched the film, it's the centerpiece, the emotional centerpiece of that film. And 
Um, if you could talk a little bit about the, the construction of that story, and did you go in knowing that that was going to be that kind of link, and then they visit the baby after when he's like two or three or something? Absolutely. So we, we actually saw that footage. They shot it themselves. There were no journalists that had been inside Aleppo for a good kind of year when we talked to them. Um, and we asked the question, you know, should we be coming in? Is there a way to come in? And they said, absolutely not. One, because you've got about 24 hours before you get your head cut off. And two, you then further endanger us to just such a huge extent that the, the project becomes um, not viable. So we devised a way to film with them on the border, which in and of itself was, was pretty hairy. Um, and we worked with them. They were already using cameras, you know, desperate to show what was happening to them. Um, and we worked with some of them in, in the training on the border for five for five weeks, basically um, following our cinematographer so that we would have these conversations about story, we would have these conversations about framing and filmmaking, and um, which was actually really wonderful. And we set some of them a task to make a behind the scenes documentary of us making the documentary mm -hmm. um, so that we could so that we could kind of play into that space together. Um, and, and when they went back, they, they understood the way that we were making this film and we really felt like we were making the film together. Um, so yeah, but the baby was was really really the genesis for us um, because we just couldn't believe that that was happening and we couldn't believe that these people were doing that with their bare hands. Yeah, and then when that baby at the end, when those men are hugging, if you haven't seen the film, it's on Netflix. It's just wrenching and just but so beautiful when they all meet the with that little boy and. Mm -hmm. So heartwarming, it's wonderful. Um, so, and then Sarah, can you talk about, you, talked, you touched on it, but when you were shooting Footprint, you did it in one day, and, and when you were shooting, when you're shooting something like that, do you, do you have a sense of where, and there's not much of a story other than it's this immersive piece about people kind of sharing what this meant, like tour guides and parents telling children about the World Trade Center, and when you're shooting, are you seeing the story or you're seeing how you're going to edit it? Can you talk a bit about that process? I mean, I think the, the two things I really knew going in were, like, like again, the arc of a, the capturing the arc of a day and then also wanting to go on these tours. Um, and so I had prearranged um, with a couple of tour guides. And some of them I just caught on the fly. Um, but um, I really didn't know, it was, a, it was an experiment. I really didn't know what I was gonna get. I knew the kind of moments I had witnessed when I was just there as a visitor and was hoping to capture similar moments. So for example, like th the catalyst for the film really was when I overheard a father telling his daughter, um, you know, trying to explain 9-11 to his daughter. And so I was looking out for families and things like that and um, just, um, but also trying to be very open to what was happening and and you also wrote this piece. I have to say, you wrote like this accompanying text in the mm -hmm. when it when it's on the website <laughs> and you wrote this really nice thing about how your impression of just the world kind of kept going. People were getting lunch and people were going to work yeah. and like people who go through that space don't feel it the way others who are visiting it. Do you know? And I thought that was a really interesting kind of um, dilemma almost in the film as well. Yeah, and, and also an, another catalyst was like all the selfie taking that was very jarring when I first went there. I was just kind of confused by it, but I think over the course of just watching and feeling the rhythm of the place, like that judgment dissipated for me, and I think that was another thing that I was hoping would come across to people watching it is like it's what starts with the selfies because it's sort of like, why would you want to take selfies in this space? But you know, by the end, it's sort of like, yeah, life really has <laughs> continued. Um, and then notes from Dunblane. Could you talk a little bit about this, like how you crafted the story and how much, like you knew that this, you knew that this was there, but in terms of um, going out and shooting and how did you approach it from a storytelling perspective? Well, when in the beginning, when I learned from Father Bob that he had received this initial letter, um, I was obviously intrigued with, um, the series of letters and what what um, what that that uh, correspondence was, uh, which most have had already happened, and so it it, it was uh, a lot of off camera conversations and building trust, <laughs> and eventually um, having access to that correspondence, which was all verbatim, and editing down um, in those letters 
and, and having a strong, it was also the first time that I had done something with voiceover. Um, and so I had a strong instinct about the, the fathers being able to, in their voices, speak to one another through and transatlantically, um, you know, at first as uh, n not in the flesh, and eventually they meet. Um, so it was just this um, construction of, of intimate um, exchange through, you know, they, they, they did exchange them electronically, but they felt like old fashioned letters. And so that's what felt so narrative and across the ocean, um, yeah. And you shoot him, you follow him from when he le when he travels. Did was did you uh, were you involved in that process or getting him that he that decision for him to come visit or did you um, no, that just I go mean know that he was doing it and went it was organic that uh, Father Bob uh, felt very um, stressed about the approach of the first anniversary of the Newtown massacre. And um, and said, you know, I don't know if he'd come, but I really, um, it, it would be so meaningful. And so, you know, I didn't uh, arrange oh, that. He, 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 but, but I knew about it. And so, um, yeah, that's my favorite, my favorite moment with, with Father Basil. He, he, he kind of um, bumps down his driveway alone at 84 and says, you know, uh, Give me a moment or two to think about it. I'm 86 and counting, and and had confront the long journey across the, the the Atlantic, and he's got his little suitcase and he's alone. Um, so I, I just found it to be like this was uh, something he felt he needed to do to pay it forward, and something I think he needed to do for himself to feel like someone understood. Um, so um, yeah, and then there was this final uh, meeting and them offering one another support. Um, so the construction of the letters culminating in them ultimately um, meeting at the, the occasion of the first anniversary. Yeah, especially with what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Oh good God, I know. I s yeah. yeah, and it was interesting that uh, for me, I mean, I'm not a, um, a particularly religious person, and so it was interesting to note that I didn't censor a lot, uh, you know, there was editing, but their letters were not particularly all m much about God. It was interesting. Um, they were really about um, two men just connecting over, uh, like, no one else would understand this, but I do. And that, um, that connection, that vulnerability, and um, uh, so that, that really struck me that they were... And, and nor were they profoundly questioning their faith. I don't know that they were having crises of faith either. They were just speaking <laughs> uh, as, any, as you would imagine anyone would who'd been in a really unthinkable, crazy situation that they'd gone through that was so unique, uniquely horrible. Yeah. Um, and on a lighter note, uh, nobody loves me. I, you've I want you to discuss, just share a little bit about the structure of the film because it's, it's wonderfully innovative. And I remember when I first saw the film, I was like, "Oh my God!" It's uh, the way you create the narration. If you could talk a little bit about that, because um, it's—I've never seen that before, and it's really—it's really charming and wonderful. Thank you. Thanks. Um, yeah, we put. You know we came back with these pieces and sort of um, understood some of the uh, elements of the arc before we sat down to edit. So, um, you know, we have all these shots of the frog um, and then we have the sort of human communities that we ended up filming with. Uh, and then we also, because uh, we knew we wanted to explore the idea of um, how storytelling emerges around an animal depending on how it appears to us. Um, had done a little bit of filming and sort of research about um, the, the frog's place in um, Peruvian mythology uh, and how that contrasts with the way that it's seen in sort of larger global narratives. So the story with the frog is always, you know, that it's the punishment. It's like you've uh, zap, you've been turned into a frog. You have to kiss a lot of frogs to find your prince. Um, and uh, in Peruvian mythology, it actually has this uh, position of power because the frog is considered um, the connection between land and earth. So we w so we knew that that would sort of help us 
you know, shape shape the uh, movement a little bit. Um, but you know, the story with how we ended up using the voiceover is really just something is missing. Like the the if the purpose of the film is to break down the barrier that's cre that's created by um, a natural reaction to the appearance of this animal, then how do we break down the barrier? Maybe you maybe you live inside of its head. You know, maybe it 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 speaking to you directly as a viewer, um, it's harder to ignore that. It's harder to tune, tune that out. Um, uh, and it allowed us to also include um, some of the sort of inform informative parts of the film or, or, or you know, like statistics about um, the loss of the frogs or what happens to its habitat in a way that was a little more um, colorful or compelling that we could add some personality to it as opposed to um, kind of trying to cram it in in some other way. And why did you choose to have it in Spanish? So again, because we ended up digging so much and, and anchoring the film with um, Peruvian culture and mythology and this animal's place within that, it became important to us to not only um, include the original language but also to um, to ask somebody who is Peruvian to to do the voiceover because obviously the inflection and and the Spanish is spoken differently in different countries. Um, there are a couple of words that are you know come from. Not not Spanish, but Quechua language. So um, we decided to stick with it, even though it it does. Um, and this, uh, it's a little bit tougher for some people to have uh, a short who's meant to be um, pretty commercial and widely available online uh, in a language that requires subtitles. But then conversely, the interesting thing is that now, even if your short film is in English, sometimes they will ask you to have subtitles anyway because those short clips for social media like the the you know one minute that shows on Facebook or Twitter you're much more likely to to grab someone's interest if they're able to read the text and then click through so <laughs> the, and, and, yeah yeah so based on the ways that things are changing it's sort of there there's pluses and minuses to doing so but it seemed creatively important and um, I think doesn't hold back um, uh, the story in some way. No, it just creates this emotional um, kind of diary, and it just makes it very emotional because the character, who's the frog, is talking about how ugly they are. <laughs> it's just very touching. So I was going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, So the question was the biggest obstacles um, in shooting their films. I mean, you know, lang language is an obvious one. Um, with the with the white helmets, I guess PTSD was a second. You know, as I said, lots of them were being attacked. You know, and attacked in terms of their moral fiber, their very existence um, as being true. Um, and there was one very key moment, kind of halfway through filming. Um, you know, these these are these are men that have lived through years and years of war. Um, and there was one kind of moment where one of them decided that he didn't trust us, and he decided that we were some kind of stooge from the CIA or something. And this kind of ripple effect went around, you know, the, the team. And we just sat down with them. We said, "Let's talk about this." And and he said, "I'm just scared." Um, and it was over, you know, it was over in a couple of hours and they just wanted to talk about it. But, you know, in dealing with stuff like that, you know, they just, they don't know who they can trust because they're being consistently bombarded um, by, you know, on social media and, and, and in person. So that's, that's quite difficult to deal with. I guess there was no time to have them sign a release form or just be there. Oh, of course. No, we did. Of course, we sat down multiple times and explained to them why we were there, what we were trying to achieve, you know, why we wanted to tell their story. But when you've dealt with five years of war, that doesn't, you know, you need to have that conversation as many times as they want to have it, you know? Let's go down the line, Sarah, with oh. these obstacles. Um, well, f you're asking specifically about interviews. I mean, I, I, because I, I just was, yeah, um, 
Uh, I mean, this particular film doesn't have any interviews, which is why I wasn't jumping in. <laughs> but um, I mean, there's always a, a, a challenge, no matter what the subject matter, building building trust. You know, I mean, I think that for me, and my experience has been finding that balance of when to put the camera down and just connect um, with who you're speaking to, and when to, you know, when it feels like the right time to turn it back on, or, you know, um, I think sometimes like as an inter as an interviewer, there are beautiful moments to be had when you don't necessarily jump in and allow give them space to kind of process things sometimes, and that can be hard, because I think when I started making films, my instinct would be to fill that empty, uncomfortable space if they're going through something emotional. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's kind of a muscle that I'm, I'm learning still to build, um, but some of the most beautiful moments can happen if you, you know, um, just create like a, a comforting space for them to experience and process. Um, but I have a question for you about that. When you were shooting, you were kind of eavesdropping <laughs> on people. I was definitely. How did you? Well, yeah. So <laughs> what? What must have been tricky then to go back over to them and have them sign a release or talk to them that you'd shot them for this film? And yeah. Um, well, so the approach for that um, sort of shifted um, during the production. I mean, I had arranged ahead of time with. The, not just the tour guides, but people on the tours to let them know, let them know we would be filming. Um, but it's a public space and there's, um, legally, we didn't need releases from people. And so, um, yeah, a lot of times, I mean, we try, and there were so many languages being spoken. I mean, it was just sort of um, really hard to explain the project and the intention and if there was a language barrier. And so we sort of made a decision to just um, allow these things to unfold and, um, and, ca and and focus on the authenticity of that experience. I'd say for me, um, I've been working in this space for like five years now with gun violence and traumatized um, people around that issue. And there, I don't know if you, Joanna, experienced this with, you know, working around PTSD, there's these issues of, of boundaries that come up for me. Um, and I don't, make the kind of films where I really consider myself a journalist, per se. And so um, the trust building and getting that emotional um, intimacy is, is paramount. And sometimes um, it's, it's the opposite of m them not trusting. There becomes a, a, a thing that happens where you're something unique. You're not a therapist, you're not, um, but there's, especially for a priest, you're, there's almost confessionals and there's information that you actually don't want to have in your head. And, you know, I kind of poo-pooed it. I don't, haven't really talked about it, but, you know, I was told about secondary trauma, but after five years, it's real. And um, it's hard because uh, you're human and, you know, there are these things where, you know, maybe your camera person is saying, you know, we have to do our job you know, you have to go over there and you're, you're human and you're thinking, I, I don't want to go over there and I don't want to put the camera there or I don't want to know exactly what happened in that room um, because I don't want to live with those images. So I'd say those are some of the bigger challenges, but at the same time, like with Father Bob, we really became close over the years. He, um, I bring him, he jokes, these uh, chocolate uh, Easter bunnies every year. And, um, you know, there's a there's a connection. There's a a feeling I have to let him know this was not to to open up like that was it's a privilege, um, and so I I feel genuinely that it's real that these relationships <laughs> with subjects are not something that just go away, and um, for them not to feel after the film that that's true. Um, but it's it's hard the boundaries of what these people are in your lives. They're so precious. It's you know, but I, I don't know how you feel about that. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we just went one step further because our latest film is actually us turning the cameras on Orlando, who's the director of White Helmets and Vrunga. Uh, he lost his brother 14 years ago and uh, couldn't say his name. Um, and then we went on a whole journey with his family and literally, you know, turned the cameras on him. And he said just the experience of, of what that was like taught him more about going forward and, and then interviewing other people. He was always the kind of strongest, both in Varunga and White Helmets, in that the rest of the crew would go, go back to their rooms and cry every day. And he managed to kind of 
I guess, bottle up all of this emotion and then could deal with it in a more dispassionate way. And it was because he had basically buried his own trauma. So you're right. You know, we'll, we'll see what happens on the next one, whether mm. that changes. My subjects were very cagey, so. <laughs> uh, I mean, the <laughs> it's, a d it's a different different kind of approach, obviously, like the challenges of a nature doc. Um, uh, <laughs> they they did, but you're, it's the luck of the draw. I mean, there's a, it's very physically demanding. First of all, like um, uh, we were at the highest altitude that I had ever been in, um, and I lived in Kathmandu for a year, so we, so the um, altitude sickness <laughs> was very real. Um, it, it was such a gift and a pleasure to go into these very remote areas. We shot in a couple of lagoons that I, I feel like maybe a dozen people have seen because it's just conservationists who go out there and you kind of see the difference. Um, the smaller frogs are in Lake Titicaca uh, in areas that uh, directly um, but up against the town, and probably because of pollution, they're smaller in size. And then those 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 big, beautiful, you know, free creatures are in these totally wild spaces. But to get there, we drove three hours, even you know, higher altitude up, and got into wetsuits. And I remember like helping push the van up this muddy track, and just being like splattered with mud, and and sort of barely able to breathe. But it felt wrong not to <laughs> help out. Um, and then you never know, like if if the animals aren't feeling it that day or if the rainfall was slightly different or, you know, it's, it's just extremely unpredictable. So that, that was um, the challenge there. But I, I have, I remembered an interesting story in terms of um, challenge in an interview, which is also like <sighs> being receptive to what the, the needs of your subject. Um, I was working, this was, was not my film, but I was working um, actually as like a translator and like an associate producer on another person's film. Um, and the subjects were all Bangladeshi and the director had this idea of uh, creating a confessional booth like you, like are used in, in, in documentaries, but that I think the wider public is more familiar with because of reality television. And I remember trying to explain to these women who are, you know, like, often police officers in pretty rural areas of the country like what we were going to do and how, and and they they looked at me like I was nuts and said so you want me to get into a room by myself and then sit there talking to myself while the camera rolls like a crazy person and I was like wow you really <sighs> helped me reframe <laughs> what a confessional is. But yeah, it just didn't make sense to them on a cultural level, and so we had to scrap that idea. You know, it was like they, they, they thought that it would give these women um, like a, a safe space and an opportunity to like get in touch with things that were difficult and maybe, maybe they were uncomfortable talking about with other people, but instead they said, this is, this is just making me want to shut down. Are there questions? Yes, I'm here. Oh, budget, you mean? Yeah. Oh, Sorry. whatever. <laughs> I mean, ours was commissioned, um, and that's because we just finished a film with Netflix, and we talked about this. They had a lot of ideas coming in around Syria. You know, we'd had such a wonderful experience together, um, and I think they also just had a brand new commissioner who actually used to run the New York Times Op Docs, who understood shorts very, very well. So that didn't feel like, you know, they, it, shorts were new to them and then we were used to them. Um, so that also felt good. I mean, budgets, I guess I can say making a film where we lived on the border of Syria for five weeks is obviously gonna be very different to making a film that takes 24 hours down in Wall Street. You know, I think it's quite obvious, if you make films, I think it's quite obvious how you work these budgets out. Commission. Commission. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I um, <coughs> don't necessarily want to speak for all of the opdocs, but from my experience, um, I mean, I, I do know that I, they don't tend to commission a lot of stuff. I think they acquire mostly. And that was the case with mine. Um, uh, 
Uh, and, it, you know, I think it is typically in the low thousands. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, my budget is, I don't even know what my budget is, frankly, because I don't pay myself to edit, so <laughs> I could probably inflate it quite a bit if I had to pay for an editor. But um, I, yeah, so, I, you know, I, I did not necessarily break even on this, but, I mean, it's a, you know. Uh, um, our film was acquired. Uh, well, Netflix came in toward the end, but it wasn't commissioned. Um, it was very much uh, mostly baked. So was this an acquisition fund? No, it was an acquisition fee. And, um, uh, you know, it's always hard with the budget. I still don't even know what the budget was because <laughs> we were there for over years and it's hard to parse out yeah. what was. Um, but I wouldn't say that that fee came anywhere close to what we spent along the way. Um, although Netflix is, uh, can, can be generous and great. Um, and so it, um, uh, and, and also the, uh, I guess I would say that the deliverables um, have uh, parts, of th things in there that uh, add to, to the budget that you might not have foreseen so much. I had been told that, but they were pretty onerous, a lot of the deliverable uh, kinds of fees. So there's things I wouldn't have spent money on that I ended up spending money on, but then I was just happy to be able to have it uh, <coughs> out there. I did, so, so it, was, it was a great thing. In the end, it's a great thing. Um, so this film was commissioned, but not unlike the Field of Vision short I did, for example, not by a publishing platform, so it could also be acquired, um, which it hasn't yet. It kind of did a festival circuit run and then might find another home. So it's, it's sort of an interesting case. Um, I, but I think a little bit what you're getting at in this like acquired versus commission question, especially when it comes to journalistic endeavors um, uh, that have a, a film arm, like Opdocs or like Field of Vision, is that if they, I mean, basically those that are privately funded tend to have higher budgets and are able to, to pay commission because they can pay for the cost of a production. And those that do not um, might go for an acquisitions model because that's what they have the budget to do fairly. Um, so they might ask you to, like if not, full on acquire completed film, then um, carve something out of material that you already have. And, and, and both are fine, like it's a fine model, it's just, it, I think it's dependent on, on what they know they can do for the filmmaker uh, fairly. Or, or you get the kind of middle ground where you get like an Opdocs or a Guardian commission, but it doesn't cover the budget, so you'd still have to go and find the money from somewhere else. I'm working on a short that's like going to be published by Opdocs, but the funding is from Concordia. Right. So I also oh, yeah, think, I yeah, as as there the options proliferate, also people team up more. So or or like even Field of Vision, which is a publishing platform, you know, realized well we have a real reputation in the film community, but these <coughs> we want to have a wider audience. So um, every single film that we published, we would um, pair up with another. Um, another platform. So it was dependent on the film. We worked with Teen Vogue, The Atlantic, The New Yorker. It, it, it really depended on why, you know, Wired, like who's going to bring a new audience to this. Um, okay, so I just have one last question because we have to wrap this up. And I wondered if each of you could talk a little bit uh, briefly about just a particularly meaningful moment for you with this film, either in the making of it or since and having it screened or having subjects see the film, like anything that comes to mind that's sort of a high point or meaningful moment? <coughs> the, the ceremony that you see in, you know, it's, it's obviously the last couple of minutes of the film, which is an interesting way to see it because the fact that a frog is talking to you is a surprise. If you watch the whole thing, it's not as much of a surprise. Um, but uh, yeah, this, this, um, this native community uh, recreated their rain ceremony for us and the frog plays a really important part. They are released so no animals are harmed during the ceremony. Um, but in filming it we also got to participate and I found it, I, d I don't know if it was, it was th if the altitude was a factor, but um, I, I was really moved. Like they, they it, was, it was just one of those, in addition to filming and recording, this is also a record of 
my life and like our, you know, our um, experiences as a crew. And I, I felt that barrier slip in that moment in a way that, you know, w felt appropriate for the film and was, was really emotional for all of us. I guess mine just most recently we showed the film for the first time at Father Bob's church about two weeks ago in Newtown and um, that was really poignant because I think uh, his congregation knew how much of a toll this had taken on him but I think you know and him telling me wow now that it's on Netflix I'm getting calls from all kinds of people and just the validation of people understanding um, that uh, how 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 hard this is and for him to get a feeling of support and community when he's usually that person to be giving it out was felt good. It felt like it, this was healing for him. Um, being published on the New York Times platform is definitely the most visible any short I've ever made. <coughs> it's the most vis visible it's ever, anything I've made has been. So um, to have that kind of audience um, was incredibly incredibly rewarding. I was a little nervous about it because it's such a um, sensitive subject matter, and I was uh, wasn't sure how you know it would be received in the ether. But there were some beautiful comments and engagement online that really took me by surprise. I mean, there were people who wrote poems and shared experiences, and I mean, I didn't. I mean, there may have been negative comments, but I didn't see one because I was just really moved by. Um, not just the comment section, but people taking time to write to me and share their experiences. And it's just, you know, I think um, the, uh, the uh, mission of the Times is to spark a conversation, and I think it really fortunately succeeded in that, so. Um, yeah, I guess I, I wouldn't normally sort of say an awards ceremony because uh, that's not the right thing, but um, with the White Helmets, we, s we were sort of certain that we hadn't won, and when we did... Um, the ability to quote the head of the White Helmets, um, you know, and to and his quote was from the Quran, um, and a very peaceful and beautiful quote um, in the context of you know Trump's travel ban. I think was a pretty meaningful moment for us. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we have to wrap it up, but I want to thank all of you for coming. This is terrific. Your films are amazing. Please go look at their films if you can.